Good evening, everybody. You're all very welcome indeed to Maynooth University and to the Maynooth Centre for European and Eurasian Studies. My name is John O'Brennan. I'm the director of the centre and I'm just going to briefly introduce this evening's event. I think we can say that this is truly a trans-European event this evening. Our speakers are coming to us from Graz, Ljubljana, Belgrade and indeed from Prague. So uh, given that the Centre for European and Eurasian Studies is the only such academic centre on the island of Ireland that engages deeply with Central and Eastern Europe and Southeast Europe, we are really delighted to be able to host this event. And I guess it's trans-European in the sense that we are here on the Western periphery of Europe and our speakers are located literally in the heart of the European Union. Um, just a word about the centre. We've been in existence for about 13 years or so. We are an interdisciplinary group of uh, academics, faculty members, PhD researchers interested in Central East and Southeastern Europe and Eurasia. And um, we are very, very keen indeed to cooperate with our colleagues across the region, especially, I think, in the small member states of the European Union, from one small member state on the Western periphery to the center and the uh, east of the EU. Um, in, in that uh, space, just to uh, briefly outline what we do, we are a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. We have a three-year project which has just begun. Uh, my colleague, Dr. John Paul Newman, leads a portion of that on the uh, modern history of the Balkans, and I lead a section on EU enlargement to Southeastern Europe and the related but really important issue of rule of law issues. And we were really uh, delighted some weeks ago to hold the first events in this series. Uh, the last one, in fact, was specifically on rule of law within the EU. We had Professor Dan Kellerman of Rutgers University in the United States talking about the authoritarian equilibrium in the EU and where most commentators tend to focus almost exclusively on what's happened in Hungary and Poland. We believe, as colleagues do, I know, in Slovenia, that developments in Slovenia deserve significant attention. So that's why we're delighted this evening to welcome uh, some of our really distinguished colleagues from the region. I look forward to a really insightful discussion and I'll hand over now to my colleague, Dr. John Paul Newman from the Department of History. John Paul. Okay, thank you very much for those uh, words of introduction, John. Um, uh, so as John says, my name is John Paul Newman. I'm the Associate uh, uh, Professor of 20th Century European History uh, in the Department of History here at, uh, at Maynooth University. And it's a great pleasure to introduce you tonight uh, to uh, uh, our event, uh, New Kid on the Liberal Bloc, question mark, Slovenia under Janusz Janša. Uh, Janusz Janša uh, has uh, charted an alarming trajectory uh, from his anti-communist mid and uh, late 1980s uh, to what he has become more recently a would-be nationalist populist. Uh, cut from very similar cloth uh, as his political ally, Viktor Orban. Uh, his third term as Prime Minister began uh, last year, 2020, this one year anniversary, which I guess we could have marked, if not exactly celebrated. Uh, but in the last year, he has indeed uh, blazed a trail both at home and abroad. Uh, there's simply no time to uh, uh, elaborate on all of the, uh, the, the policies that Jansha and his government have pursued. Uh, but I'll just add on rate, uh, uh, briefly on a few of those. Uh, Jansha has last year replaced directors of various national heritage and cultural sites, the National Museum, the Museum of Contemporary History, the Moderna Galleria, the Modern Gallery. Uh, Jansha and his government, uh, particularly the Ministry of Culture, of course, have claimed that these replacements were regular and that they were necessary to depoliticize these institutions. Uh, his critics and his opponents um, have said that these are something akin to a political purge. And indeed, this was the gist of a uh, open uh, letter petition, which
which was signed by over 170 academics and experts in the field, uh, including, I think, pretty much everybody on this uh, panel this evening, uh, asking for some answers uh, from uh, Yansh's government and also from the EPP, uh, the political group of which Yansh's party is a member. Yansh is a, pro a prolific tweeter, likes to be on social media. He tweets uh, in Slovene and um, uh, what, what a language which approximates English, if it is not exactly a, a pitch perfect English. Uh, notoriously in November last year, uh, of course, Janusz Jansz uh, repeated uh, false claims about vote rigging and election rigging uh, in the US presidential elections, calling on the night uh, of the election for Donald Trump um, and claiming uh, that the late ballots coming in uh, were some kind of ruse from the Democratic Party to try to alter uh, the legitimate outcome of the, uh, um, of the election. When he was called on this, uh, he told his interlocutors, of course, to calm down. It's actually the words he used uh, in a brief uh, Twitter exchange with me uh, at about 3 a.m. on the morning of the, uh, um, of the election. Ayansh's attacks, of course, extend to independent and or critical media. He's currently in the process of what seems to be defunding uh, the state broadcaster, Esther R. Uh, and again on Twitter, attacking uh, uh, um, journalists uh, who are critical of his line both within Slovenia uh, and internationally. Uh, perhaps most notoriously uh, last month, I think, uh, a very vocal attack uh, on a journalist at the political, the online news site, uh, Lily Bayer, who had written a very good article uh, with uh, a very well-sourced article uh, outlining the ways in which Jansha and his government and his allies uh, have been attempting to intimidate um, and uh, uh, threaten uh, uh, journalists that are critical of his line. True to form, Yansha responded on Twitter uh, and falsely claimed that Bayer was uh, lying. Uh, he meant lying, of course, uh, uh, and that she had been instructed uh, to tell, uh, to, tell uh, um, to be dishonest in this, uh, um, in this article. So with all this in mind and, and with a sense of alarm, uh, um, I, I wanted to, uh, as somebody who's interested in Slovenia um, personally and professionally and has many friends in the country, um, I wanted to call this colloquium uh, to sort of discuss what's happening in Slovenia, what has happened in Slovenia, um, and what is likely uh, to happen. Uh, we have four uh, um, uh, scholars uh, of international repute. Uh, I'll introduce them one by, by one. Uh, Professor Florian Bieber, uh, the uh, director of the Center for Southeastern European Studies at the University of Graz. Uh, Professor Otto Luther, uh, the director of the Research Center at the Slovene Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, in Ljubljana. Uh, Professor Tanya Petrovic, uh, head of the Institute of Culture and Memory Studies, also at the Slovene Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, and Professor Ksenia Vidmar Hordvat, a professor of sociology, uh, culture at the Faculty of Arts at the University of Ljubljana. It's my great pleasure to invite you uh, to uh, uh, welcome you all to this uh, event this evening. Um, the format is very straightforward. Uh, each of our uh, uh, experts will speak with, for between sort of five or ten minutes. Um, on various aspects of the situation and the circumstances in Slovenia. Uh, once everybody has had their say, I'll uh, invite the panel uh, once again if they want to make any uh, uh, comments or responses to, to what other panelists have said. Um, and after that, we'll throw the floor open uh, to, uh, to questions from the audience. Um, those of you who have questions, you can type that into the Q&A box, uh, and I'll read those, up for the read those out for the panelists. Um, I would ask that you please stick to questions only. Uh, we simply don't have time this evening uh, for long comments uh, uh, or commentaries. Uh, so please, please restrict those uh, um, uh, unless they kind of inform uh, the question that you're putting to our panelists. Okay, so without further ado, let's begin. Um, let's begin uh, with uh, uh, Professor Florian Bieber, uh, who is going to speak a little bit about the uh, regional and international dimensions of the situation in uh, Slovenia. Uh, so, uh, Florian, uh, you have the floor. Thanks, John Paul, and thanks also for for organizing and hosting us. I mean, I'll, I'll um, rather stick to the, as you pointed out, to the larger context, because again, I have my colleagues from Slovenia who can much better speak to the particular case. And John Paul, I think we all had our, all of us who were active on Twitter had our Twitter confrontations with the prime minister. I had one a few years ago before he became prime minister when I criticized a poster to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the war uh, in Slovenia which was 
the party was commemorating with a picture of a soldier coming out of surrendering from a Yugoslav tank. And uh, anybody who knows the context of the, the war, this was, uh, these, were these were recruits, these were not professional soldiers, and they were sent uh, to Slovenia to fight for something they were hardly committed to. And I thought it was very inappropriate and rather hateful to put a poor soldier on a poster, you know, you know, a surrendered soldier on a poster to commemorate the war. And he called me, I don't know, a Yugoslav nostalgic and a far left-wing activist. But I think this is exactly what this is about. I mean, one can laugh it off and, you know, one, if one is based at an academic institution elsewhere, one can, one can um, you know, ignore these kind of, but, but there's a larger pattern. I think this is what, what we're talking about. And I think, uh, let me just kind of map out how he fits into this larger landscape. And I think, first of all, he fits into it by this, um, by this element of polarization. So I think this is the this is the first element where where he thrives on polarization, and everybody who criticizes him is either uh, a, a far left wing ideologue or is um, or is ill informed if one is a foreigner, um, and he's used that to the signatures of the petition as well as uh, others who've been critical of him. So with that, of course, this is a classical way in which kind of you know a populist far right populist. Uh, rhetoric where basically there's no legitimate debate, there's no legitimate di disagreement, but um, there's only my opinion and everybody else who's wrong. And, and so this kind of polarization, constant polarization, we know, of course, from this kind of uh, populist, um, uh, extremist populist position uh, across Europe and in, across the world. So that's the one element. The other element is, is uh, the, the kind of strong ideological anti-communist line, which he's been using. And if you follow him on Twitter and also his statements, he's been kind of picking up evidence that all of the critics of, uh, are uh, Yugo nostalgic, pro-Yugoslav, far left, and so on. And again, this is this kind of um, polarization over questions of ideology and kind of these, you know, you could say culture wars, making a culture war where there isn't one. And this is particularly ironic in a country like Slovenia, which, uh, you know, has had a much less, let's say, controversial uh, socialist legacy, let's say, than um, other countries like Hungary or, or, or even, you know, the, the Czech Republic, which at least experienced, you know, Soviet invasion and uh, totalitarianism. I mean, the Yugoslav experience, whatever one thinks about it, was not a totalitarian one. And the kind of, but the politicization over it is, of course, one which is which is a central part of this kind of regime. And that's where he's similar to Orban or or peace in Poland, where the argument is basically that they are doing the work of the transition, which was never completed. Now, this is this argument. Why can you even talk about this 30 years later? Well, because that transformation after 1989 and 1991 was incomplete and the communists are still pulling the strings. I mean, it's a very, rather absurd argument considering, you know, 30 years and generational changes, but this is the basis. So it's this constant polarization over identity. If you look at economic politics, there's not that much difference among the mainstream parties, but it's about culture. And, uh, and so it's no surprise that in fact, media and cultural institutions are the ones targeted by this kind of program. Um, so, and then the other element, which is, so it's, it's polarization, it's uh, delegitimizing any criticism and it's direct attack. I mean, this is the other thing which we see also, which is similar to, you know, which far right parties are doing, you know, such as uh, the FBU in Austria or AfD in Germany or, uh, or parties like that. Uh, or uh, Fidesz in Hungary, which directly and personally attack any critic. And I also have experienced this in Serbia, where the ruling party, you know, attacks critics personally um, in, you know, press releases. And this is this both at a level of ministries. Uh, we also see this in Slovenia, where the Minister of Culture, we get directly uh, attacks critics. Uh, the whole notion that you that you use media and uh, state institutions to attack critics from a position of power is already in itself a highly problematic understanding of democracy. I mean, I think we all know that governments have a right to respond to criticism, and I think that's there's nothing illegitimate about that. But the nature in which uh, public positions are used to constantly attack and criticize those who are critical of them is a highly unusual understanding of democracy. So in that sense, he fits into this larger European landscape of 
far right wing populists. Now, does he, you know, is he like a copy of uh, of Orban or 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 the the Polish scenario of peace? I mean, there are some there are some differences, and I mean, I'm curious to hear what my colleagues from Slovenia are saying. I mean, one difference is, of course, that he doesn't have the political power at the moment that uh, Orban had or peace when they won elections. He's part of a fragile, narrow majority uh, government. He was not elected. I mean, he was not elected to run the country. I mean, he was the product of a failed coalition. So that's very different than Orban or peace who came to power with a clear mandate, a problematic mandate and one they've abused, but one where they got a majority based on a programmatic offer, which is something which Janša does not, did not get that mandate. And looking at opinion polls in Slovenia, they do not suggest that he has increased this popularity significantly since he's taken office a year ago. So that's a big difference. And of course, that has all kinds of consequences. I mean, one of the big things which uh, this kind of populist uh, authoritarians have been doing in Central Europe is that they've rapidly tried to change the state apparatus in their own interest, appointing judges, changing the laws and the rules of the game to tilt the democracy in their favor and transforming uh, grad gradually their system of government from a liberal democracy democracy to a competitive authoritarian one. And we see this in Hungary, which is by many indicators of democracy, no longer seen as a democracy. Um, and Yanis Jancsa hasn't done that, but it's not because he, he didn't want to, but because he hasn't had the full control and power and resources to do it. And this is why it's even more timely to talk about, because uh, by his statements, by his political acts of over a year, uh, one, and by the close relationship to, to, to Viktor Orban, by the media support Viktor Orban is giving through media outlets and financial assistance, um, you know, there's all reasons to believe that given the resources, he would also seek to transform Slovenia in the same kind of uh, authoritarian or semi, uh, as it's known competitive authoritarianism as Hungary. So um, it's important to talk about it exactly to prevent this kind of sliding away from liberal democracy. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, we can say that this is part of a larger European pattern. Um, so it's not an outlier. I mean, this is, uh, it's it, the new kid on the block uh, is the saying, and it's of course ironic considering that Jancsa together with, with um, Viktor Orban is one of the big survivors of, of the transformation process. I mean, few politicians have made a career starting in 1989 uh, and until today and are still politically relevant. Um, and I think the last point I want to mention, of course, where there's also a lot of similarities uh, that, you know, there's continuous and, and repeated suspicion about abuse of office in past since as prime minister. And uh, so there's there there's also a financial element to all of this so ideology to some degree. And this is what is often ignored when one talks about Orban is that there's plenty of evidence of uh, of abuse of office for financial enrichment of uh, cronies of the government and ideology sometimes one suspects is at least in part a cloak to cover up this enrichment uh, policy of, of a narrow circle of elite. I mean, this is what we call state capture. And in that sense, looking at previous stints of Yanis Jancsa as prime minister suggests that he has a similar way of understanding uh, state power and exercising it. So in that sense, I think we're talking about a part of a wider pattern um, and, and one which has some structural differences but uh, that does not mean that they aren't uh, significant risks associated with the way in which uh, Jancsa has been ruling Slovenia over the last year. So I'll leave it at that for now. And uh, I'm also curious to hear from my, from my friends and colleagues from Slovenia about their take. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Florian. Um, Thank you very much for, for getting us started, Florian. Uh, I'd like now to turn to uh, uh, Professor Otto Luthard. Uh, 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 Otto, would you like to uh, carry on the uh, the discussion, perhaps respond to some of the things that Florian has said? Okay. I'm just, oh, okay, it's fine. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, like, um, Florian, uh, I too am very glad to be part of this panel. Uh, well, um, uh, being a head of a public research institute, I'm particularly interested in um, uh, uh, Janša's and uh, his party ambition um, uh, uh, plans um, in public sector, either um, in research um, uh, landscape or in the neighboring fields like museums, universities, and uh, 
uh, galleries. Um, I have organized my opening dis discussion in two points. Point one, uh, although familiar with their, their uh, Jansha's way in, uh, of doing politics, uh, we actually uh, were quite struck with the dynamics of changes made in the last year since he is in power. Uh, it is surprising even for the standards of SDS, uh, I mean his party, while uh, loyalty remain uh, the only criterion of appointments. Uh, equally striking um, as the sheer number of changes uh, in the public sector um, is the method of implementation. Uh, just as eight years um, ago, uh, Yasha and co uh, show no regard whatsoever for a professional criteria. Uh, even though um, it has been clear um, from the beginning on that the government led by SDS uh, uh, was going to pursue one party agenda, it is nevertheless uh, shocking to observe um, first the tenacity uh, with which the changes are being made, um, then the brutality toward anyone who shows the tiniest bit of resistance and uh, the utter disregard for state or institutional legislation. Um, if the statue uh, of certain institution, for example, the, the gallery of modern art, uh, does not permit a particular change, the SDS people will simply change the statue. Um, particularly upsetting and pain, painful, of course, is the score settling with those who dare rise um, their voices. Um, in such cases, um, uh, the imposed demotion um, also inevitably, uh, inevitably uh, leads to character assassination, whereby in some cases, uh, like in the case of the in, um, Museum for uh, Modern History, um, uh, the employees were being forced to discredit the work done by the former director. In the same time, the, the, the members of the SDS are constantly portraying um, themselves as victims, uh, while being the party with the best political and uh, uh, organizational network, uh, they are representing themselves as abused, um, marginalized and in incapacitated. In reality, uh, however, they control whole areas of the uh, governmental structures and public institutions, uh, in, including, um, including galleries, um, museums, universities, and uh, research uh, institutes. Point two, um, uh, their way of uh, doing politics is based on the um, so-called culture of self-sufficiency. Um, in other words, um, Jansha knows uh, quite well that the, for most Slovenian uh, citizens, uh, Slovenia is the only territory um, or point of reference, uh, uh, apart from relatively small percentage of highly mobile Slovenians, the vast majority perceive um, um, traveling abroad as uh, vacationing in Croatia, making excursions to either Venice or Vienna and buying knickknacks in towns uh, directly beyond the Slovenian-Hungarian border. Uh, convinced and led um, to believe that they live in the most beautiful country in the world, uh, most Slovenians fall so a su surprisingly easy prey to political provi provincialism uh, practiced by uh, SDS politicians. And uh, part of this uh, process concerns also the, let's say, purification of national history, starting with the redistribution, redistribution of, uh, of res responsibility uh, for the civil war during German and um, Italian occupation um, in World War II, um, recent um, 
uh, politics of memory aims at radical reinterpretation in which the members of resistance are translated into um, terrorist or a Bolshevik um, guerrilla um, and the whole resistant movement into civil war uh, that ended in genocide and exodus. Um, radical historical revisionism now going on for almost 25 years is also heavily rooted in the myth about um, the divided Slovenian nation um, that has, according to um, Janša and his people, uh, to be fine-tuned in the new national history lately, um, as you, some of you probably know, supported by the establishment of the new Museum of Slovenian Independence. Well, those who disagree um, to all this are labeled as uh, radical leftists, uh, parasites, and political slash ideolog ideological zombies. Uh, because of this and because of um, already mentioned personal, personnel uh, changes um, in public sector, people are starting to be cautious and reserved to publicly express their opinion. In my belief, um, it is a fear and not some novel political strategy, strategy as they claim, what is keeping uh, Jansha and uh, um, his close allies at least one step ahead, um, either from political rivals or allies. Fear and uh, authoritarian way of doing politics, I'm afraid, uh, is the political reality in Slovenia in the beginning of 2020s. Um, it might not yet be labeled uh, uh, as fascism, but it can clearly be understood as a sort of post-socialist despotism. This is uh, for, for the start from me. Okay. Thank you very much also uh, for this uh, um, rather bleak uh, outlook on the present situation uh, in, uh, um, in uh, Slovenia. Uh, I'd like to turn to, uh, I'd like to turn to uh, uh, Tanya Petrovic now. Um, if, uh, Tanya, would you like to say a few words? Of course, thank you. Thank you, John Paul. Uh, okay, so um, maybe I'll just start where, where Otto uh, more or less ended with this uh, very uh, salient uh, narrative and the image of uh, Slovenian, Slovenian nation as a, essentially uh, deeply problematically divided. And this, uh, this metaphor and this narrative really, I would say, uh, shapes the politics since the, since the independence has never lost its, its relevance up, up to today. And uh, as Florian said in the beginning, uh, there is uh, like what present government does is basically uh, perpetuating this idea of uh, Slovenians failed transition or, or maybe not failed, but not entirely finished. So uh, kind of a, a mission of the present government is to bring this transition to the end. So usually when they, uh, when the representatives of, for instance, Slovenian Ministry of Culture are asked about this uh, overtly problematic uh, changes uh, at uh, public cultural institutions, what they usually, like the, their answer and an attitude can be uh, basically uh, summarized uh, into something that uh, they are doing justice to the public sphere because after so many years of having those leftists, it's now turn to bring another views, views that are essentially connected with the national culture and the national values. So um, this is this idea of uh, kind of Slovenian problem with uh, keeping too many continuities with socialism that needs to be stopped and corrected. And that should be done, of course, through the reconciliation to us that we all stick to the real values and uh, go to the future 
holding these values on, but essentially, uh, as we could already hear, this is essentially also uh, a battle over the past and the acceptable dominant uh, version of the past, past of the Second World War, past of the socialist period, and also past related uh, to the peri period of uh, getting in independence. So the they, there, there can be only one version of the past and that version needs to be homogenized and essentially national. Along the, all the changes and all the initiatives in the cultural field uh, are directed towards establishing this um, new narratives, new cultural narratives uh, that are close and deeply related to so-called real national values around which there should be no debate. So for instance, around uh, this museum of Slovenian independence, where, which will obviously be established, there, uh, there is already legislation put into motion around it. We did not have any real public debate or any experts in the field of museology, history, culture were essentially involved in, in conceptualizing this museum. And when asked about the, uh, this, uh, representatives of the uh, ministry simply said that there is no need to discuss that because the Slovenian people said what they want and how this museum should be already in 1991. So that is basically how these things are done, are done uh, right now. And of course, all the seemingly um, in conflict with this idea of national uh, unity and reconciliation uh, is very polarizing discourse and uh, ex exclu uh, exclusivist discourse that um, ruling party and uh, the prime minister so much ins insist upon. And it is, uh, of course, everyone which does not fit or could not fit or is suspicious in any way for, for this achieving this national unity is uh, kind of not only excluded, but uh, basically ostracized and uh, put into very bad line with, with uh, very offensive language with politically very problematic um, ways of addressing and so on. So these are typically people from other uh, parts of socialist Yugoslavia. These are migrants. These are, uh, of course, extreme leftists, as they like to uh, call everyone who oppose their politics uh, and so on. But what I also want to say is that uh, we need to keep in mind that this discourse of reconciliation is not it is, of course, not a new phenomenon, and it is not only right-wing pop populist discourse. It, 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 they don't have kind of um, exclusive right of using that. That discourse is very present uh, and was very constitutive of uh, most of discourses around Slovenian independence in the 90s. Uh, of course, it was transformed and misused later, but uh, this discourse on, on the need of Slovenian national unity uh, played a very important role on different... Um, it's, it's kind of one of, of the topics not to be questioned in Slovenian public space, I would say. And that's something to keep in mind. That's also the fact that... Um, within these discourses are articulated by also moderate nationalist or even not nationalist uh, politicians and public figures. Uh, many of those who insisted of, on this discourse of reconciliation had also very close relations with Jansha in the past. So it's kind of, um, of course, uh, I would say a much broader um, phenomenon uh, not related exclusively to Slovenia or former Yugoslavia, that is uh, one of the so-called Eastern European transitional symptoms where in a way uh, it's important to, there is this firm belief that it is important to uh, achieve uh, national unity after this problematic period of socialism. Uh, and uh, the way to do that is to pretty much relativize not only the legacy and uh, reality of uh, the socialist period, but also um, the roles of victims and perpetrators from the Second World War, something Otto was already uh, talking about uh, today. 
So in that sense, uh, somewhat paradoxically, but this is the moment where I can actually agree with Yanis um, uh, Jansha and the politics he's representative of. In a way, a transition in Slovenia has not been finished because uh, we still have this uh, narrative about national unity as something that um, that occupies uh, not only uh, uh, populist right wing sphere of the politics, but politics in general uh, in Slovenia. Um, and I was also kind of laughing with myself, uh, thinking of this new kid on the block. Okay, Slovenia is maybe a kind of new kid on the block, on the liberal block, but Janša is by no means new kid uh, in, uh, in this story at all. In the last 20 years, uh, how much I lived in Slovenia, Janša, it's third Janša's uh, mandate as prime minister, actually. And uh, of course, uh, many things are still there and we are kind of all uh, dealing with the fact that not much is changing and this is this um, history that repeats itself. But of course, on the other hand, uh, I would say, and I think we all easily and intuitively can agree with that, that uh, what's going on right now is different, not maybe so much because of the situation in Slovenia itself locally, but uh, because of the international, global and European context where uh, simply this kind of politics is much better situated and supported than it used to be maybe in, uh, I don't know, 2004 or 2012 in previous uh, two instances of uh, Janša's um, governments. Uh, it's, uh, of course, um, we heard a lot already about this uh, regional context, European context, global context, where Janša uh, fits uh, very well right now and what is going on with media, media property and the way media is treat, uh, are treated in Slovenia with all this swift changes in appointments of uh, public institutions, um, in the, uh, the attitudes towards um, migrants, uh, towards uh, workers' rights. We have this uh, kind of recognizable, very familiar uh, pattern that, of course, Orban, Orban already made uh, the road to others and Jansha pretty much follows that road. I have to, and uh, of course, it's time for all of us to mention maybe uh, the ongoing pandemic and the fact that Janša became prime minister at the moment where, uh, when the epidemic was started in Slovenia uh, at the moment of the first lockdown. And all of this, all these restrictions in movement, in gatherings, uh, in uh, impossibility of direct exchange, of protesting, uh, pretty much uh, worsened the situation and prospects of democracy in Slovenia right now. I have to say that at the moment when Janša, it was clear that Janša will take over the government after the previous co co uh, coalition collapsed. I, I don't know, I was of course very naive, but I thought, okay, this guy graduated from the faculty of um, defense, this thing that was very prominent during socialism you could study defense and protection. So he really had tools, theoretically at least, to uh, deal with the um, public, um, pu public health risk seriously and efficiently, but of course it, it's far from the reality and he did not bother even to, to pretend to do that seriously. What they did is uh, what we already heard about all these changes and very kind of harsh and um, not sophisticated in interventions in the spheres of media, politics, culture, and essentially, especially in, in public institutions. So, uh, of course, the hopes uh, were naive and um, yeah, maybe I will stop here and we can discuss more then in the next round. Okay, thank you very much for those uh, for those insights, Tanya. Um, I, I, do, I do wonder when this sort of purgatory of post-communism is, is, is going to end and, and how much longer this narrative can sort of can be used uh, uh, by the political right. I mean, as, as Florian says, 
Um, it's been three decades, but, but this, it, it doesn't seem to be weakening, doesn't it? It, it seems that this notional uh, need to finish the revolution uh, uh, is, is still quite politically potent, isn't it? Um, I'd like to move to our final speaker now. Before I do, uh, just a reminder that the Q&A box uh, is open. Uh, I'm getting questions now, but if, if people have questions for our panelists, uh, please, please feel free uh, to, uh, to, type, uh, to type those into the Q&A box. Um, our final speaker uh, is Professor Ksenia Vidmar Horvat. Uh, so Ksenia, you have the uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. I will try to be uh, as brief as possible because the predecessors already said a lot of things that I wanted to address in my presentation. Uh, Florian, I think, very nicely summarized uh, all the areas, realms of changes that are occurring, uh, interventions in economy, in politics, in culture. Uh, Otto and Tanya uh, related uh, their their talks to the sort of historical context, which make this. Uh, um, uh, brute uh, um, demonstration of power perhaps possible at the moment. What I would like to emphasize in my, my um, uh, presentation is uh, the following. First, as Florian said, yes, it does seem appear that uh, Yansha is a copycat of Brexiters, of Trump, of Viktor Orban. Uh, he is uh, using their tactics uh, with uh, constant bombardment, uh, with uh, violent language, derogatory remarks, character killing of people who disagree uh, with him. So that's definitely there. Um, he's uh, employing uh, conspiracy theories uh, as far as Trump's election is concerned. Yes, he is... Uh, um, supported his uh, signing this uh, theory that the election was stolen. But let me remind you that already in 2018, he claimed that elections were stolen from him uh, because he was serving the, uh, the prison sentence uh, under allegation of corruption and claimed that this uh, case actually uh, was a disadvantage to him appearing on the election. So he's actually a kind of original in that sense that he invented this narrative of stolen election. And he's been talking about the deep state, repeating it after Trump, but also in an innovative way throughout the transition. So we have this slight uh, sense that there is a similarity between these authorian figures uh, on the block at the moment. But I would like to point the differences because Yasha never really fully subscribes to conspiracy theories. Uh, to the contrary, he's using, he's actually using the COVID, the current situation, COVID-19 situation as a platform on which he uh, basically um, um, not just demonstrates, but actually executes uh, his um, power struggle and um, silence um, all the opposition from the streets. And uh, oppos street opposition was crucial for his, uh, the collapse of his government in 2012. So basically the prolongation of anti-lockdown, uh, of lockdown um, anti-virus uh, measures are used not as a health or safety issue, but really as a way to, to silence the, the protests. Uh, so in this way, he's different. Uh, he, yes, of course, he's uh, learning from Brexiters and Trump and others and Orban how to polarize uh, the public. And he's done that before. But um, in his previous attempts, he actually dwelt quite strongly on revisionist discourse. At the moment, it seems to me, I may be in disagreement a little bit with Tanya and Otto, it seems to me that revisionism is only kind of surface narrative. Uh, he's not really that much interested anymore in the interpretation of uh, World War II and post-war uh, socialist period, but is, I think he's rather planning a future for himself in power. So basically uh, a polarization that he's inducing is more in the sense of the culture war, which Florian also uh, mentioned in his speak, but uh, this culture war has a different, again, profile from culture wars that are going on in the Western democracies. Uh, it's not so much war uh, as a consequence of uh, pluralization, fragmentation, 
liberalization of societies, which created uh, um, a class of um, especially white uh, working class uh, males who are full of grievances and resentment uh, toward the social change and are easily mobilized to become uh, um, populist constituency. In Slovenia, we have no such situation. It hasn't happened or not to the, to the, uh, to the degree that happened in the West. So the culture war that we are witnessing at the moment is uh, fought for, um, with I would say long, uh, long or at least longer term uh, objective, namely to really change the cultural landscape of the country. So by taking over a core institution, cultural institutions, museums, galleries, it's not just a pure manifestation of a brute power in the sense, yes, we can do it. It belongs to us now because we are in power, but it's really an attempt to change basically uh, culture um, um, identity. Uh, so it's a sort of cultural engineering where all the radical or the progressive cosmopolitan, if you wish, art and culture is going to be removed from the visibility from public space. And in its place, you will get this parochial, narrow minded, nationalist, uh, um, uh, uh, pop folk um, manifestation of um, patriotism. So it's basically about changing cultural identity. So it seems to me that this culture war has a, a futuristic uh, agenda, not so much. Uh, dealing with the revisionism of the past. Yes, of course, revisionism is still a very potent uh, ideological fuel. But in the past, uh, Jansha and his party actually were losing um, uh, electoral votes and, and um, sympathies among the public if they uh, interfere with this agenda too directly. Because the, the memories of the partisan uh, resistance are still quite uh, widespread among older generation, even in the rural area. So he, he did not uh, square well uh, in that regard. So it seems to me that this is a kind of echo of an old agenda, but basically it's projected over the future. So this is the first, this is the first problem. So it's not about how we deal just with the past and the revisionism, but really how to, 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 to basically face this new um, situation that is uh, occurring with the purpose of somehow modifying our future already. The second problem is the, uh, that he uh, is now, Jansha himself, uh, socializing into the existence a new political class, uh, a class who has absolutely no uh, affinity for uh, playing a role of a public servant with accountability, responsibility. Uh, so they are, as himself, often ignorant, openly sarcastic, uh, spreading hate um, at will. So, so basically, this is another problem uh, with a long term effect because the, the uh, confidence in the political class will drop. Uh, sooner or later and is already low. So now we have still this strong anti-Yansha sentiment, but on the, in the long term, this is not a good prospect for the development of liberal democracy with strong mechanism of public service and, and accountability. Uh, what is new is that he is, as Tanya mentioned, he's operated, uh, operating under the COVID-19 restrictions which means that there is uh, no real room for uh, open public protests to be seen uh, in media. Um, and this somehow disencourages uh, people, uh, sort of um, uh, gives a sense that not much can be done. And also in a way does um, um, stall the progress of the oppositional protest uh, in the public. And in addition, the opposition to the government is becoming uh, fragmented because in, in, uh, in addition to this um, um, uh, legacy of protest movement that has been around for the whole transition, really, we now have new anti-government groups who are basically COVID deniers, deniers uh, and um, groups who believe in COVID-19 conspiracy. So you cannot have United Front here because it's about political ideals really and the, the value of information uh, and so on. So it is not just polarization on the one hand, but it's also fragmentation on the side of the, of the um, uh, popular protest. 
Uh, so, uh, in this, in in some to summarize, it seems to me that what we are witnessing here is rather a chapter that's announcing a future, uh, and that we will have to deal with this future more than we will have to uh, um, really uh, fight against this uh, revisionist discourse because. Uh, this is basically at the moment, it seems to me, using our energies uh, and uh, it should be really um, perhaps more important to, to, um, to, to be aware of the dangers that are going on under this umbrella of revisionism uh, with a, longer, with a longer, longer impact. Finally, I would like to say um, that uh, Yansha in part is a product of the EU integration process as are the populist and nationalist across the, the post-socialist region. Uh, why? Because I'm, this is my argument, I may be disputed, but EU agenda during the integration uh, was really that we are joining the European family of cultural, um, culturally close nations. So this instigated nationalism, cultural nationalism, um, um, uh, all types of uh, romophobia, Islamophobia, phobia against other. So basically, we we've been through one generation of of citizens in Slovenia already who have been growing up up during this new new mentality or sentimentality of fear and and hatred toward the others. And it seems to me that as far as the EU is concerned, that we need to go back to the, the principal social contract and ask uh, how we will measure the, the, the um, 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 our participation, not in cultural terms, whether we are close culturally or not, but whether we respect uh, the rule of law and um, democratic uh, procedures. So uh, all the uh, 90,000 plus um, uh, um, conditionality lines, which we need needed to fill out in the in 2004, prior to joining the EU, uh, actually at the moment appear to to have made no no significant contribution to to stop the dangers uh, to democracy. To the contrary, uh, this populist movement has a, a strong back. Uh, background in the 30 years of the transition. And yes, in this sense, as Tanya said, transition is not over, but not because just of the post-socialist states themselves, but because Europe, the EU, uh, has somehow failed to address uh, uh, this issue of cultural uh, contract, whereas uh, it really did not uh, do well uh, in the post-socialist region. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ksenia, for those comments. Um, we have uh, several questions now in the, uh, the Q&A box, but before I turn to those, I, I wonder if any of the panelists um, would like to briefly respond to anything that any of the other panelists have said. Uh, are, are there any follow-up comments or, or points? Uh, if not, I can go straight to the Q&A. I yeah, I sort of yeah. Uh, maybe I would. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with Senia. There is a difference, and maybe th this moment, the kind of uh, this direct fight over the interpretation of the Second World War is not is not maybe so much to the fore as it used to be previously. But uh, I mean, it's it's still there and it's, it has always been a struggle for the future, I would say. And the, the, that, that whole discourse was there and I totally agree with her. And I think that's a very important uh, uh, point to make that the whole, the whole discourse about the uh, totalitarian, two, two totalitarian or three totalitarian paradigms in, uh, in Europe and um, kind of very paternalistic treatment of uh, new Euro European Union members uh, that we all were, could follow easily for so many years in public discourse actually has to do also with uh, strengthening of this very populist and right-wing um, uh, fo political forces in Eastern Europe who actually feed from these, um, these discourses uh, requiring uh, break up with the continuity and building the whole new, uh, not only new political agenda, but new political culture, new kind, new 
kinds of uh, doing politics in the first place as something that should bring uh, this discontinuity that is so much wanted. So, so the role of kind of common uh, European context in this sense is absolutely very important. Thank you, Tanya. Because uh, it's also a point that Jelena Subotic makes uh, in her uh, in her book uh, in, in the context of Croatia and uh, Croatia and uh, Serbia. Uh, are there any more comments uh, uh, or follow-backs from anyone on the panel? Anyone else like to have a couple of words before I head down to the, the Q and A box? Okay, uh, in that case, uh, let's go to questions from the floor. Um, I have a question from Francis Jacobs. Uh, he has actually has two questions. Uh, Francis writes, uh, the, e the EPP has finally parted with Fidesz. I'm not, not sure that's true, actually. Uh, what is the EPP attitude to the developments in Slovenia and to the SDS? Uh, uh, that's the first question. Uh, and the second question, uh, Slovenia will take over the EU presidency later this year. I think in July, uh, how does Jansha intend to use the presidency? Uh, anybody want to have a have a crack at either of those two questions? I'm glad to to chip in here. That's okay. Um, well, you know, I think uh, John Paul, as you already said, I mean, it's not the EPP which parted ways with Fidesz, but it's Fidesz which parted ways with with the EPP. So. So um, this is a bit of an embarrassment that uh, that uh, with all the threats and everything, it was in the end Fidesz which took uh, itself out of the European People's Party. Um, it probably would have you know continued to be a member if it hadn't taken that decision by its own right. So from that point of view, one cannot expect that the EPP is going to act quickly against or critically towards uh, Jansha's uh, party uh, in Slovenia. I mean, uh, and also, I mean, because I've, for the reasons I've mentioned, where the kind of transformation of the country politically and in Institutionally into more authoritarian regime has not happened yet, despite all the pressure against uh, against um, institutions and, and critics. Um, there is also less foundation, which. Uh, even the re reluctant uh, EPP might find hard to ignore. I mean, you know, we have Hungary where university was expelled, where gender studies was outlawed, where the you know constitution was rewritten, the electoral law was written. I mean, luckily we're, we're way, way far away from that in the case of Slovenia. Um, and thus I'm afraid that European parties have, and, and I mean, I would also be very explicit. I mean, the, the socialists have been doing equal kind of calculations with their allies in Romania. I mean, this is not a not a one party uh, uh, flaw, but this kind of lack of critical words to their own partners in a member state is something which we can expect and things have to get very bad for them to really uh, care about this. And to the second question um, about the EU presidency, I don't think there's going to be much happening because I mean the EU presidency is not another big important uh, issue anymore. And you know you have also the, co the, the contrast that a lot of it is done on a technical level where the prime minister doesn't have much say on that. And I think in the foreign ministry and institutions you have people who are very competent and I mean so that that all will, will work probably despite that. I mean, you know, I think the, the, the issue is that as somebody who's been working on the Western Balkans, we're seeing a similar kind of rhetoric where Hungary has become the biggest advocate of enlargement, but that's that's kind of like, um, it's called, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of a, a poison chalice because, you know, if Hungary promotes enlargement, uh, countries uh, which are in, in charge or which care about rule of law actually see this as a reason why they don't want enlargement. Um, and if Slovenia becomes an advocate under Jansha and the presidency for, e, for the enlargement towards the Western Balkans, which it will probably be, it might actually do more harm than good because again, all those who, who kind of see the rhetoric of Jansha will be very worried that it's for what reasons he might advocate it. So from that point of view, uh, I, I don't think there's going to be much of an impact, but if anything, rather negative for, for the Western Balkans. Thank you, Florian. Uh, would anyone, uh, anyone else have anything to add uh, uh, to, to Florian's comments and uh, the panelists, or I can move on to the next question? Okay, I have a question from Rox Stoga. Uh, he writes, uh, Florian Bieber already raised the question of state capture. And my question is directly connected to that. Namely, uh, I wonder if Janos Jansha is not distracting us with his culture war and provocative tweeting. 
uh, while he is making himself and his fellow travelers rich, uh, or at least well off uh, behind the scenes. After all, uh, he is someone who uh, still has not persuasively uh, explained the origins of his assets. It's something we didn't discuss in the, the introduction, but Florian uh, briefly mentioned it. Um, anybody have any comments on that, on Rock's, uh, Rock's question? Yes, if I may. Um, well, um, uh, um, this, is, this question is close to what uh, Xenia was um, telling us uh, about uh, revisionism being as a sort of a paravan uh, uh, that is used to, to cover off some, uh, some uh, uh, plans. Um, well, uh, it was always, when we talk about um, Jansha and his buddies, uh, it was always a question of um, how to use the resources how to um, uh, uh, organize the privatization and gain something out of it. Uh, so this is uh, for sure. And I would uh, uh, go back to the previous question, what is going, what will happen during the Slovenian uh, presidency? I'm actually afraid that uh, uh, he, uh, Jansha is going to use the resources at hand to strengthen uh, his relationships with, to, to his um, allies, either Orban and, and, and the people from the Balkan states, um, because they will not be in, in, in a position to actually um, do something, um, you know, um, structurally, uh, but he is certainly going to, to, to use these resources to strengthen. And um, yeah, the question of resources, or let's say the money uh, is, um, one of the central questions here when we talk about this new old kit uh, uh, um, uh, around the block. Thank you, Otto. Uh, Ksenia, Tani, is there any, anything you'd like to add to, to that or uh, any points of that question you'd like to pick up? Or I can move on to the, uh, the next. Uh... Yes, I, yeah. Sorry, I wouldn't underestimate neither side of his activity. Yes, definitely his financial gains, uh, but it's also power. So uh, when I have the debates with my uh, colleagues uh, whom uh, Janja resemble, uh, resembles more uh, Putin or Trump, it's a consensus that he actually would like to be Trump <laughs> in the sense that uh, it has absolute power, but also absolute access to, to resources. Um, um, uh, the question that follows in the box uh, mentions that, yes, Trump already used the, the rhetoric of stolen election as a precautionary measure in 2016. In 2016, I'm not sure, uh, my memory doesn't go back that far, uh, that Yansha was really uh, uh, so um, uh, impressed by Trump because he wasn't uh, such an avid uh, user of the Twitter. So it is only with the Twitter that he's now actually been able to create this atmosphere of psychosis. For that, his training in defense uh, um, uh, uh, studies is really very important because, because some, of the, some of people would say he's uh, fighting a psychological uh, warfare. So I would say he's working on different platforms. But I would not be so much concerned about his style of governance or, uh, or really um, um, uh, the takeover of the power. It seems to me it's very important that we uh, stick to the core question, how to defend uh, the, the, the democracy itself and then work with different directions. And just I, I think that we need to really stop being um, so obsessed about what he said, God's strategy. Yes, to distract us not from you know gains he may get, he may get from this uh, tweeting activity, but from the real questions of how to defend democracy, basically. So this is our task, and I, th I think this should be task that should be taken together within the EU. We are still EU member, uh, and. Um, um, so it is, I think that refocusing on the real <laughs> problems would really help. Thank you. Thank you, Ksenia. Uh, that, that's, a, that, that's a comment from Nancy Wingfield. Uh, uh, she mentions that Trump also uh, used suggestions of electoral theft in, in, in 2016. So this was something that occurred uh, um, 
sui generis in, in, in 2020. Uh, I have a question from uh, Oleg uh, Chupinio. Uh, he has, it's a question to all of the panelists. Uh, uh, and Oleg asks, uh, to, what, to what extent, in your opinion, uh, the evolution of Jansch's political views and rhetoric have been a reflection of the current global trends uh, towards a liberalism? Thanks. Um, Tanya, do, do you want to start uh, with, with that, uh, uh, with, with Oleg's, Oleg's sure. question? Sure, actually, I think I addressed that at least partially that uh, I think um, Yansha is there for a very long time and his style uh, is recognizable and constantly uh, having some constant features, but, features, but there are also changes. And some of these changes definitely have to do with the general global and regional illiberal climate, especially in the societies where he finds his uh, allies. And what we were just discussing, this uh, constant diverting di uh, uh, um, uh, our attention from what, what really matters to some ephemeral daily conflicts. And uh, that's something so familiar, like for everyone in Serbia, that's what Vucic does already for many years. Like you always have to have something new to divert attention from, from really serious matters. And Yansha is in that sense uh, acquiring that, that style uh, definitely. And uh, there is general, uh, uh, illiberal turn is itself also, of course, uh, I think there is a question about that uh, coming in the row about the general crisis of representative democracy and it has to do with the general crisis of European Union as such. So I think uh, it's a kind of, uh, it's, there is an evolution. It's not maybe a very drastic one uh, from, from the 1991 to today. Yansha is pretty stable on the spectrum of, Slo on Slo of Slovenian politics. There were not very dramatic changes in his style or, or attitude or rhetorics. But it's definitely different general climate that uh, I would say gives additional hate to uh, what he's, he's, is he saying and doing right now. Um, if I may uh, join, it, um, well, um, I think Sina is right. These, these are questions uh, uh, about democracy. So what he's doing actually is um, uh, is he's undermining a basic um, the democratic standards uh, because he, um, he has seen in Hungary that this is possible, that you can also uh, do politics um, by you know, misusing these uh, democratic standards. Um, uh, well, I'm, I had to think back um, um, it was mentioned what his studies were, and um, I, I'm quite sure that he was a, a good, good pupil in the subject Marxism. You know, when we talk about the revolution that goes on and on, I think he, he, he's quite aware that, you, you know, you have to have this tension. If you stop, then you are dead. So he's, uh, he's, he's, he was actually quite good, I, I presume, when he studied uh, the, the classics of uh, Marxism, not to speak about Trotskyism. So, um, well, I, um, some 20 odd years ago, I was invited to um, a US um, university and um, I had a semester with the um, um, second year students, n n not knowing a lot about uh, Europe and especially not about the um, uh, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, socialism, and so on. And so uh, the, the the topic was the post-socialism, and and sen so I started to um, with explanation what uh, uh, in a uh, in a part socialism looked like. So uh, and at that time, um, uh, people uh, would still watch Star Trek. I don't. I, I hope there are any trackers among the the audience tonight. So uh, people 
who remember Starship uh, Enterprise, the next generation, and uh, and the Deep Space Nine, and the Captain Picard, and the Seven of, of Nine, you know, this character of this Borg community. So um, uh, when I um, was looking through my papers and found this um, uh, lecture about this uh, and, and, and using this comparison, I it, it struck me that this is what he aims at. I mean, he's looking for for this Borg society where we are one part of, of all. So we all are, and then and, and the top of, of it, it, it's he and his, his uh, um, companions. I mean, um, in a way, um, and, and he, he was quite good in, in, in you know, uh, gaining the knowledge about um, revolutionary acting. And the other hand, he somehow believes, you know, in, in this um, collective. Sorry to, um, this might be uh, away from our discussion, but still. No, no, very, very, very illuminating, highlighting also. And if there's any publishers in the audience, there's certainly a book there, uh, the political metaphors uh, um, of Southeastern Europe in, in, in Star Trek. Uh, John uh, O'Brennan would like to uh, uh, jump in. Um, I would like to follow up on, on I think, upon one of the <clears throat> panelists made. Uh, go ahead, yes. John. Thank you very much, John Paul, and thank you to all our contributors. Really rich and fascinating discussion. I was thinking about Jansa's capacity to produce insults, and we may become the Maynooth Marxists in tweets uh, to come in, in the days to follow. Um, but I wanted to pick up, if I could, the question that Rock put and that Florian and Ksenia and others answered. Um, uh, and it's, it's really about the European Union role here. I wonder whether the appointment of a new European public prosecutor, Laura Kudruta Kovesi, is going to make a difference because although um, the system allowed for member states to opt in, uh, two of the very problematic states where um, the dispersion of EU funds are concerned, Bulgaria and Slovenia, have actually opted in. So I wonder whether in the years to come, now that the office is in place and is up and running, what it might be able to do in Slovenia in at least focusing on the abuses in that specific domain. And my second question is about the European Union more generally. Um, after Brexit happened, the, there were lots of senior people in the European Commission who said that on reflection, it really wasn't, hadn't been a good idea for them to stay completely out of the referendum. They did so for good reasons because the commission just doesn't intervene. Um, but on reflection, they thought that they really should have had more of a presence in the UK rebutting the disinformation uh, with empirical evidence and facts. And I wonder whether irrespective of the European People's Party, the European Union more generally should get involved in Slovenia. And if that is the case, what might the European Union do that it isn't doing now that might change the constellation somewhat? Thank you. Uh, any of the panelists like to take up John's, uh, John's points? I would perhaps just give you a brief comparison when, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, when um, there was, a, um, I think it was like a few months ago when there was a debate about a uh, um, fund to help uh, European member states uh, to get out of the COVID crisis or the post, in how to move into the post uh, COVID crisis. There was a letter of intellectuals and academia, academics from Hungary uh, NGOs uh, published in The Guardian, I think, where they asked the European Commission not to give the money to the Hungary until there is a clear sign that uh, the rule of law and mm -hmm. transparency in finances is achieved. So I would hope for a more proactive role of the EU, because uh, it seems to me that the, the time that we have lost, just uh, going back and forth between uh, the debate of uh, you know, autonomy and sovereignty on the one hand and federalism on the other hand, we have really lost precious time. And now I've, we can already see that um, Euroscepticism is becoming part of the populist right um, discourse as well. 
So we may not be surprised that, that perhaps in a few um, months or I don't know, within a year, we will see that the uh, membership will be, become questioned or that there will be, you know, we already have alternative group of uh, Visegrad group. So basically, uh, I think that, yes, we would be hoping for more proactive, uh, proactive role in the sense that I mentioned before, uh, 90,000 know, uh, alliance or, or um, um, sort of requirements uh, inserted in the conditionality to become EU member state. I think that we need to have some kind of measure where we do a regular checkup. <laughs> Are we still there? 90,000, 90,000. Uh, I mean, proactive role, I think, is definitely needed at the moment. Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to keep moving through these questions because there's, there's quite a few of them and I, I want to get to as many as possible, but if, if, if panelists would like to, to, to respond to... I think Florian did want to come back on this. But I can, I can uh, pick it up on, a, on a, some yeah, other... Yeah, if you want to hang on sure. to that and, and yeah. we'll, we, can, we can perhaps do a, a double take. I have a question from Nancy Wingfield uh, and Nancy asks, uh, do you have any ideas as to why Yanis Yancha's supporters seem to have been so obsessed uh, with learning who was behind the academic petition of last December. I found it curious that his trolls and his adherents uh, seemed so convinced that the signees were duped, uh, that there weren't their own independent actors. So, so the, the background to this, as you know, the petition, um, some, of, some of us who were involved in signing this uh, received quite a lot of mail uh, from various media outlets or from, from various Yansha supporters. Um, and time and time, some of them, of course, were quite rude. Uh, but time and time again, there was a uh, in incredulity uh, that the actual people who had signed this document were the signees, that they were certainly duped by some left winger inside of Slovenia, um, and they were desperate to find out who this was. Uh, um, and, and, and you know, the, the sense of this whole thing was a fake, but it, it had been, uh, can, you know, it had been fabricated for somebody inside uh, Slovenia. It was a very sort of paranoid style of. Uh, um, uh, I think what Otto described as political provincialism. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts or any ideas about that? Yeah, maybe. Go maybe ahead, I can you. start. I think it's a. Uh, this petition is a symptom of like the reaction of of Jansha and his supporters to to this petition is a symptom of, of their general uh, imagination of how you know institution work uh, work and how individuals politically function and how they should function. And in that imagination, there is not much space for any autonomy or a kind of autonomous acting. Relatively recently, our colleague from, uh, from our institute, our younger colleague, uh, participated in a, on the public television uh, in a discussion and she was, it was an anniversary of the erasure and she spoke about that and said that no, uh, Slovenian, no, no Slovenian president or prime minister ever uh, apologized uh, to erase for what has been done in 1992. And uh, several days after that, I'm a head of this institute where this colleague works and I was getting emails from various people asking me to position myself about what she was saying. And I was also asking, why should I do that? Come on, I mean, I'm like, <laughs> and they were always very upset that I don't want to kind of, you know, take control over that situation. That's my role, right? So I think that's, that's part of that uh, kind of um, way of thinking that things should be very hier hierarchical and uh, our colleagues from abroad cannot uh, be like nothing but deceived about this. And they are simply a victims of some uh, evil Slovenian um, scholars, uh, leftists who um, presented them with a wrong picture and they of course have no idea and cannot have idea. There is also this, Janša was saying that at some point that no one can really uh, discuss situation in Slovenia without knowing Slovenian language. So that's part of that as well. Like it's our business and you poor guys, you are just manipulated because you anyway cannot know anything about that. Thank you, Tanya. I mean, it, it was very striking to me, I must say, because I mean, we, we've talked about uh, uh, Jansch's uh, um, 
rhetoric and, and his attempt to polarize the political discourse as a political strategy of uh, um, marginalizing uh, uh, otherwise legitimate political opponents and, and actors. Uh, but I mean, the, the experience of, of, of responding to uh, um, queries on this petition really did suggest that uh, at, at some level, a lot of his supporters had internalized this um, and, and were really convinced actually uh, uh, that there was a large left-wing conspiracy which was dead set on uh, um, uh, uh, destroying uh, uh, Yansha uh, and it was coming, you know, it was, it was coming from within, it, was, it wasn't coming from these sort of suckered uh, uh, um, Western, Western intellectuals who, who, don't, who don't know Slovene anyway. Um, Florian, I, I, I guess you might want to respond to John's point, perhaps also to Nancy's question or uh, is there anything you want to say about either of those topics? Thanks. I mean, just to John's point, um, it's, um, I mean, uh, or yeah, let, let me just, um, um, I think I've lost my, my thread now. So I'd, let me just uh, kind of get back to it in a second because, um, yeah, let, let me get back to it in a second. I'll, I'll give it some more thought and then I'll chip in. Okay. Well, if I may. No worries. I... Yeah, go ahead. If I may chip in, I mean, um, I would try to connect several questions and comments. Um, well, um, there was a um, discussion on what the uh, EU is supposed to do, either with Slovenia and Janšas and Orbans and so on. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I would not be so happy if someone from outside would um, massively intervene, because then uh, um, this victim hooped of him and his party will, will probably raise. And I have to remind you, there was a um, situation when EU was to intervene to Slovenia. There was a, a threat that the Troika will come and then, you know, uh, and that time, uh, this was uh, right after Greece, uh, this was quite a dangerous scenario to, for a country uh, that would uh, uh, leave Troika to come in. So. Um, I, what I miss is this um, intervention from several parts of Europe, not just West East, but from the South, from the East, from the, the North. So like, like the discussion that we have today, uh, because this is obviously something that uh, annoys them. Uh, uh, the discussion coming from outside, either from media, either from academic uh, um, sphere. So uh, for me, intervention from Europe is from one part to Europe to the, to the other. And um, if we will have this, um, uh, you know, binary uh, pattern, you know, West, East, and then Westerners will, uh, will talk uh, about uh, the Easterners and then uh, try to teach us how to go on. And uh, um, this, this, is, will, this will suit them. So um, beyond this, um, let's say bureaucratic political interventions, I would like to see more um, of these discussions, comments. And I was quite happy with, uh, after journal press was so uh, very interested in what's going on in Slovenia. I mean, I spoke to the, the journalist from Süddeutsche Zeitung and uh, I, she was quite knowledgeable because she's stationed in, in Vienna, but still uh, she didn't know much what's going on. And uh, somehow uh, Slovenia was discovered and I would like to see it stays there in an agenda. Uh, 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 so I, what I'm, I'm looking for is more discussion from different uh, institutions like media and academics, uh, academic field and so on and so forth, so forth. Not just Brussels as the um, center point of the uh, administration. If, if I can jump in here to Otto's point, I mean, I think there are two levels because I mean, I think that's what John was asking is, you know, if there are, if there, you know, if there are breaches in the law, like, you know, if money is abused, resources yeah. are abused. I think there is, there is definitely something which the EU institutions could and should do. And I think it's also partly shifting away. I mean, this is kind of going back to Nancy's question, shifting away from the culture issue, but to say, I, I don't think the EU could or will intervene on the issues of the kind of uh, cultural wars which which Yancha is waging, but it can intervene and say, if there is abuse of resources, then this merits because this is my taxpayers' money and somebody else's taxpayers' money. So it's, and I think this is what, what the EU has been neglecting to do in the case of Hungary for all too long. But it's also, there's a second level, which is about communicating more effectively with citizens. And I mean, I, I can say this from the experience in Austria where our chancellor 
who likes to go hiking on Triglav with Jansha, um, um, uh, has, has been, been in recent days rather making rather controversial statements about the European Union. And we have the luck that the representative of the EU in, in Vienna is Martin Zellmeyer, who was, of course, the chef de cabinet of, of uh, Jean-Claude Juncker. So he's a deeply political and also very knowledgeable, I mean, whatever one thinks of him, very knowledgeable person. So he has been communicating very effectively the Commission's position uh, on talk shows, on uh, news. So, you know, I think what you need is have an, an, a commission representative in, in, in all EU member states, I mean, by all means, who are political, I mean, who are able to communicate the, the commission's position effectively. And it's not about, you know, punishment or, or, or giving stories, but setting the record straight because he could in a very few words on the evening news explain where this, the Austrian chancellor, without naming him, fundamentally misinterpreted what's going on. And I mean, I think this can really help to have to set the record straight, not by lecturing, but by just having a competent, politically apt um, representative of the European Union in a member state, especially one where it might matter a lot. And I think, that, you know, there's a lot which can be done beyond the, the dialogue, which, uh, which Otto, you were pointing out, and I fully agree with you, which is about, you know, kind of a broader European dialogue about what kind of democracy we want and what kind of political uh, exchange we want, which is not, shouldn't be centralized, but is of course, you know, where, where, where what we are having right now, where we can have these dialogues in all levels and it should be um, in a sort of way open and multi-directional. Thank you. Um, we're really running short of time. We just have about five minutes. Um, so this might be the last time I can go to the, the Q and A. So I, I, I apologize in advance. There are actually quite a few questions here, some very good ones, and, and we simply aren't going to have time to, um, to get to those. Uh, so let me grab two questions, and, and this might be my final uh, um, trip to the well. Uh, I have a question from Vita uh, Zala, uh, and Vita asks, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, paraphrase, uh, could the panelists address the prospects of the upcoming 2022 parliamentary elections, uh, perhaps through the lens of the crisis of representative democracy? Uh, and I also have a question uh, from Victor Kennedy, uh, and Victor asks, what are the implications for the universities, um, especially the humanities and social sciences, uh, and what can we do about it? Um, I, I wonder if we might ask, um, I, I guess Xenia would be the most, uh, uh, the, the most appropriate person to ask about universities, given that she, she works at the University of Ljubljana. Uh, Ksenia, would you, would you like to address Victor's question about the uh, um, implications of Yansha's policies for the universities and for humanities and the social sciences? Well, um, the, the main problem that I see is that um, we are uh, witnessing uh, uh, public um, stigmatization uh, of, uh, of um, science. Uh, that is based on uh, thorough research, on scientific methods, uh, on uh, really uh, legacies of intellectual work. And instead, because there is for a long time now in Slovenia attempt to, to open parallel universities or academic institutions, uh, we are now moving into this direction of relativism of knowledge. And I think this is also part of this cultural war so that you have uh, top historians who can now uh, discuss, you know, as experts uh, issues for which they have no uh, scientific background or knowledge. So this is one thing because new generation who's coming to the universities perhaps uh, does not really know what does it mean to be uh, involved in uh, rigid scientific work, uh, either in social sciences, humanities or elsewhere. So it seems to me this is the main the, the main problem really that we are devaluing the the, uh, the quality um, uh, work in social sciences humanities and plus we are being of course the moment we are critical we are being uh, associated with uh, with the left so it's um, you know only a matter of time where <laughs> we here on this panel <laughs> will be probably you know. Uh, characterized as uh, promoters of some uh, far right, far left, sorry, uh, agenda. So basically uh, it is uh, crippling in terms of public debate, academic debate, uh, because uh, of course there's always a, a problem of censorship, self-censorship, but more importantly, this kind of relativization of science, especially in historiography, 
uh, but also in social sciences, you know, because critique is uh, the integral part of uh, autonomous, incredible uh, intellectual work. And in the atmosphere that we are at at the moment, uh, this is of course uh, curtailed and uh, is having long-term again effect, especially on, on new generations who are being uh, victims of this environment. Not anti-intellectualism is on the rise, of course. Well, um, about the question of election uh, from Vital Zalar. Um, I'm still an op optimist and I still hope that there will be the change before 22 elections. Thank you. Uh, would anyone like to have the last, uh, uh, the last word uh, on, on any, either on these last, uh, these last two questions or anything that's been uh, discussed this evening? Okay, uh, well, in that case, um, let me thank uh, all of our uh, uh, panelists uh, tonight for an, in an incredibly stimulating uh, and fascinating discussion. I, I really learned a lot, uh, uh, very insightful, but we also got some constructive ideas um, about the ways uh, we might con confront what is happening in Slovenia and the way we might organize uh, um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, some kind of some kind of resistance uh, towards this. Uh, thank you all for uh, for coming along. Thank you for your questions. I apologize that we didn't get to everyone. Uh, uh, like I said, we just didn't have time uh, to do that in the end. Um, uh, the next event uh, uh, at the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence is on the 14th of April. We'll be discussing another uh, a grievous political problem. Uh, we'll be discussing the Bulgarian parliamentary elections, which, which of course are taking place on the 4th of April. Uh, and Dr. John O'Brennan will be in discussion uh, with Dr. Anna Krasteva and Dr. Dimitar Bekev, who was associated with the, uh, um, uh, with the Jean Monnet session. So thank you once again to our panelists. Uh, thank you to the Maynooth uh, uh, University Social Sciences Institute for hosting us this evening. Uh, thank you for coming along. Uh, I wish you all a pleasant evening uh, and uh, uh, good night. Good night.